this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Wherever you find us, whether it's a video or podcast on your favorite platform, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. You can also find us on major social media platforms. If you go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com, you can find links to the videos or MP3 files, which you can download and enjoy without commercial interruptions. If you're into classic horror, ghost, and adventure stories, I narrate Nightshade Diary, and you can find links at NightshadeDiary.com. If scary stories are your bag, and listening to encounters with cryptids, ghosts, dogmen, and other weird creatures sends a shiver up your spine, then go to SupernaturalStoryTime.com for links to our weekly podcasts. Noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird can be found at eerie.news or visit the Stranger Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com. Please subscribe to my newsletter on Substack. Just go to mppelliser.com for a link. I want to thank you for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing? It's Marnie with Stories of the Supernatural. Everybody's good. As you can tell, I've got my farm outfit on today. It's been raining a lot out here where we're at. Like I'm like every once in a while, I've almost had like a a a a a, a fall because the mud is getting. It's been raining here a lot in North Florida. I mean, I know there's other parts of the count, country which are in a drought. <laughs> we're not having that, which I'm very glad. But at the same time, we've got a lot of rain. But anyway, uh, also I wanted to remind you guys again about the uh, getting the um, getting on the uh, because even though I silence this. Uh, what did I, okay. Um, that's my grandson, believe it or not, asking, because he lives in a cottage on my property, asking what's for dinner. That tells me he's really hungry, okay? Because otherwise, normally he knows that I'm doing the show at this time, so, but that's, that's the nature of the beast. What can I say? Anyway, um, you know, get on, uh, my, uh, uh, my Substack newsletter on the list, you know, besides when I put out the shows, I put out a lot of articles on there. I do announcements. As a matter of fact, I, I did just announce that my latest books, The Phantoms of the Follies, it is available for pre-order on Amazon, but it will go on for sale on October 4th. Okay, and of course, you can either probably find me as on Amazon under my author page of Marlene Pardo Pelliser, or you can go to Miami Ghost Chronicles or MP Pelliser, and I have links there that will take you to directly to Amazon if you want to pre-order it. Okay, right now the only, right now I only have a Kindle edition. A little bit later, I'm going to have the print, but right now to get the Kindle edition, it's uh, available for pre-order. All right. And again, I want to remind you because people have asked me about my chicken thing. I moved my chicken thing to TikTok. If you want to find out, I do chicken and farm farm life stuff on my TikTok channel called Chickenista Lady. Okay. That's where I have all my chicken updates and things and all that neat stuff. And unless something really unusual happens, I'll mention my chickens because believe me, I, I'm, I work with them every day. Um, but if you really want more updates on that and farm life and all the other things that I got going on here, which is why I'm wearing this, go to Chickenista Lady on TikTok. All right. Now let me get on to the good part. The good part is who we have as a guest today. This is the first time the gentleman is here on Stories of the Supernatural and his name is Samuel Chong. Okay, Samuel is a certified court interpreter and Chinese translator, instrumental in arranging for the Chinese publication of Michel de Marquet book, The Uba Prophecy, which has been a bestseller in both China and Taiwan, a rare phenomenon. He's also translated the book 334% Lies, the Revelation of H.M. versus Stuhl, an autobiography of the high master of the chair of a secret society that was started in Germany. Today, he dedicates his efforts in promoting the messages in these books. He graduated from UC Berkeley with a BA in economics, Universidad Carlos III de Madrid with an MA in finance, financial analysis, and he currently resides in Los Angeles, California. <clears throat> now, I'm going to read a little excerpt of what he describes as far as um, why he became so interested in the Theuba prophecy. Sometime in 2014, I stumbled upon a book on Amazon titled Abduction to the Ninth Planet, a report by the author who was physically abducted to another planet. 
Okay, and of course, his book was written by Michel de Marquet. Curious about the author's encounters, I immediately borrowed this book from a library to my great satisfaction and answered almost all the questions I have had since I was young. And this is what we're going to ask Samuel about because I find that super interesting. Help me welcome him. How are you doing today, Samuel? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me here. On the contrary, it is my pleasure. Okay, so here you, what was this? I mean, I know some people always have these questions, but what happened when you found that book? Was it just a chance thing or were you looking for that type of book? What happened? Yes, I was uh, looking for the type of books about ET contactees because I was uh, very curious about what messages the ETs give to us. Mm -hmm. uh, if they can come to Earth, if they have uh, advanced civilizations and technologies, we can just from learn from them and learn from their technologies and ways of living. It's like a shortcut for us just to bypass all the troubles and to get to the highest level we possibly can. Right, now let me ask you, because I know there's a gazillion million books out there about UFOs and aliens. What was it about this book that this caught book, your attention? Go yes, ahead. this book contains specific verifiable information that I actually verified myself and doing a lot of research and also searching the internet. Uh, unlike other ET books or UFO contactee books, the information contained and the explanation given to the book, given in the book about the mysteries of the world, um, I mean, make perfect sense to me, resonate in my heart. For example, um, some people say the pyramid is built by uh, thousands of slaves in Egypt. That doesn't really make a lot of sense. There has to be something else that really built the, the, the structure in a very precise manner. And, and this book gives all the answers. And especially the, the chapter about uh, who is Christ. Uh, I mean, I read the Bible and I didn't believe a single word in the Bible until read, I read this book. It connects all the doubts, all the, um, all the unexplained mysteries in the Bible as well. So uh, to, to me, this book is an answer to all. It's a, it's a perfect book for, for me to really find out what's really going on and what really happened in the past. Let me ask you, so obviously it sounds like Michel, he was, what, what happened with him? He was abducted or how did he get this information? I mean, he was uh, abducted uh, to uh, their spaceship, the spaceship of mm -hmm. um, this group of ETs called Theoban, the Theobans. And then he was taken to their planet for nine days and then came back. So it's his personal experience, uh, what he saw, what he heard, what he observed, and uh, what he actually experienced. So this is actually a book of uh, uh, his nine-day experience on that planet. Okay, so obviously this made a deep impression on him. What did he talk? What did he say about these aliens that took him? How did he describe them? Were they friendly? Were they helpful? Or were they just studying us? Because sometimes everybody always wonders about that. Yes, for this group of ETs or aliens, they are a very beautiful race of aliens. They are nine foot tall, eight or nine foot tall. They have uh, blonde hair. They are Caucasian looking, like Nordic looking, mm -hmm. and they are hermaphrodites. And they have a male and female sexual organs in their body and also they never age they're always looking like in their 30s so they never age at all um, they have all these supernatural abilities and uh, he felt a uh, great love being present with this group of aliens so he didn't have any fear they were really friendly to him and they showed him all they could do like the supernatural abilities like levitation and materializing objects and and also like uh, healing all the diseases and also all the knowledge. It's just like um, um, like what uh, Jesus did in the past, uh, all the miracles was shown to him. They disappeared and also reappeared. Uh, amazing, uh, amazing information. How old was he when he got abducted? Well, uh, it happened in 1987 in June in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, he was living in a place near Cairns. In the middle of the night, he woke up. He didn't know why, but he wrote a note to his wife saying that I will, I will be gone for 10 days and there's no need to worry about me. 
And then he walked outside of his house and into his backyard, and he was lifted up uh, to mid air. And then they entered, he saw this uh, beautiful alien, and they went into a parallel universe. Um, the parallel universe is very interesting because it answered all the questions about the Bermuda, Bermuda Triangle, the disappearing uh, airplanes and also ships. Mm -hmm. Um, inside this parallel universe, he saw people wearing medieval clothes and also people who were like savages who couldn't really communicate with them. They were actually trapped into the parallel universe. They couldn't get out. They didn't know how to get out. Um, and then it was explained to him that this is uh, what really happened to the people, the ships and the planes near the, uh, the portal or the okay. warp in Bermuda Triangle. They were sucked into this parallel universe. So in this parallel universe, time stops and people don't feel any pain. And they don't feel thirst or hunger. So they just remain there unless they know how to get out. Um, so I find that very interesting because I was very curious about the Bermuda Triangle before. Right. So this parallel dimension, it's not like, you know how some people say, well, there's a parallel dimension where there's another Earth. Basically, what you're describing is a place where they're, like you said, they don't feel hunger, they don't feel pain, and but they don't know how to get out unless you know how to get out. So like they're like in a way, almost like in a suspended animation kind of thing, it sounds like. It's more like a suspended sphere okay. around in space near Earth. So there's a guy named uh, David Pilatus yes. who wrote a series of books called Missing 411, yes. documenting all the hikers, people who went to national parks in the U.S. and who just simply vanished. And then when people found their corpse, they're like uh, far away. Uh, they couldn't have possibly walked that far within that short period of time. So um, I think uh, this parallel universe theory or parallel sphere uh, theory explains uh, those people who just simply vanished. They were sucked into this sphere and then they remained there and some, somehow they kind of were thrown out and then they, their bodies were found uh, in faraway places. And uh, David Pilatus also documented a few cases in which when they found a corpse, they found that uh, there were bones, like people could see the bones. It seems that they were walking to the bones, um, mm. they, they they didn't feel any pain because a conscious person wouldn't have done that if they felt the pain. So I find that uh, uh, co corroborating with the theory that in a parallel universe, parallel sphere, mm -hmm. um, people just don't feel the pain. Right, and I and I've heard I've heard of what Dave Politis describes, where like you said, people, children even are found far away. They traveled over terrain that it's like, how could this child, sometimes toddlers. Now, the only thing, and, and, and I've wondered about that myself, like, is it, but then at the same time, he's just, you know, since he's crunched all these numbers, you, you almost think though, that there's some type of intelligence behind it because certain people are the ones that disappear. You see what I'm saying? It's almost like if you would say, well, it's across the board, but he's found that there's certain denominated, you know, like certain um, commonalities among the people when you start looking at them, that it almost makes you think there's some type of intelligence as to who gets pulled in. Maybe there's a way that this portal is, how can I say, programmed to, you know, pull in or something, certain people. But yes, I know that you know, among all of the different theories of how, why are all these people disappearing? That one of, I mean, one of the theories is that, that, that there's a portal into another dimension. Yes, I think the portal is the key. Um, he has a map um, showing all the clusters of where people who mm -hmm. just simply vanish and who got missing. And I think those are the places where the parallel universe sphere floats around. So they are not just in one location, they're in several locations, and the Bermuda Triangle is one of the most well-known one. And they just don't remain in that uh, specific uh, location. They float around. Okay. So that's why sometimes uh, some people get sucked into it, some people don't. And I think uh, 
Um, it can explain some of his uh, missing 411 cases. And I think uh, this is a, a plausible theory to look into. Sure. Sure. I mean, there's a lot. I've heard everything. I've heard Bigfoot gets them. Uh, people living in the woods get them, you know, but and I, I understand because it gets crazy. But it's true when you when you look at the cases, because he accounts for people that could have been killed by animals. He discounts people that go in there for suicide. You know, he takes all of those out. And when you look at the numbers, it's abnormally high as to what happened to these people, especially people that were there a minute ago, you know, and then they go around the curve and then that's it. They're gone. And I, yes. and I know people say, don't be the last in line because a lot of times when you're out of sight of your group is when you, you're gone. Yes. And I was uh, uh, thinking if we have the technology of really uh, like uh, having a satellite to to really see where the anomalies are um, using electromagnetic devices uh, and sensors mm -hmm. to see where the concentrations of the electromagnetic anomalies occur, we are going to be able to find the exact locations of this uh, uh, warps or portals. And I think that's a good start point. Also, Let me ask you something. Do these, do these, do these ETs, in other words, they use this portal back and forth. Are they responsible for people going over or it's just being at the wrong place at the wrong time for somebody that gets pulled in there? They're not responsible for it uh, because this is just a natural phenomenon. Okay. And they use this parallel universe as a transitional station, just that mm -hmm. other people on earth wouldn't see them. Um, so they were like a hiding place from other people on Earth. Okay, so in other words, they really don't, uh, they're not there, they're not the ones that are like, pulling people into, and I have heard of what you describe, those type of ETs, I have heard of them, that they're considered one of the species. Let me ask you, in the information that this gentleman was given, did they say if there's other types of ETs around? Yes. They say, uh, they, they didn't just say that, they showed the author, okay. Michelle de Marquet, uh, about 200 different kinds of ETs. Okay. Um, they showed uh, him the bodies of those ETs floating in a very beautiful golden doko. A doko is uh, like a half egg shaped uh, structure that uh, people can see from inside to the outside, but not from outside to the inside. So he okay. saw about the 200 different uh, bodies of ETs floating. And some of the ETs look, at, look like us. Some of them don't look like us at all. And there are all kind of uh, very interesting species of ETs. And there are um, like many, many different uh, species of ETs in our galaxy. And I would okay. say there are at least uh, 600 of them or so. Okay. Did they tell him what is their, wh why are they here? Or, or what is the attraction to us? Well, uh, they're here. Um, they have been here in the past. And they're okay. here just to give another warning to us, as they did in our past. So they were like uh, guardians or mentors to us, constantly observing us and also okay. giving us directions on where we should go in our lives. And, and uh, according to them, there are uh, nine different categories of planets in the universe. We on Earth um, okay. are living on category one planet, and they live on category nine planet, the highest level. Um, so they're like professors, they're like elementary school students. Right, okay. Let me ask you, is, is there any truth, because you also hear the theory that one of the attractions that they have towards humanity is... Um, for genetic material. In other words, that they might have a problem, you know, with their own genetic material, either to become depleted and we have better genetic material. Did they ever tell him something along those lines? This information is not revealed uh, and okay. they actually ask us to do our home homework at okay. uh, finding out whether this information is true or not. So they did reveal some information about the grace um, saying that, that, not in the book, but uh, telepathically to the author after he came back. Um, so Michel de Marquet revealed in a public lecture saying there are grace that um, inserted uh, 
devices or implants to us, uh, mm -hmm. but not as many as some people claimed. Only about uh, 150 people or so by the year 1995. They did this because they wanted to observe us um, because they were losing their immune system. We had also been losing our immune system since 1948. Yes. So they wanted to see how we respond to the same situation. Mm -hmm. They, the greys are a dying species, but they also are a category one planet. They also mm -hmm. um, come from a category one planet. So uh, they're just like uh, us uh, coming from a uh, sorrow, a planet of sorrows. Um, so they, they really uh, are just observing us and they, they don't, intend to cause any harm and they have not caused okay. any harm and if they do want to cause any harm the this group of ETs the Theobans would have prevented them but they okay. say there's no danger absolutely no danger at all okay so when he got abducted did he after that initial abduction from Michelle did he did they come back and ever visit or take him again no after the nine days uh, spent on their planet uh, he was sent back and he was told uh, to write a book, which is this book, The Uba Prophecy. Uh, Michel de Marquet wanted to go back because uh, The Uba was just like a paradise to him. After being shown a paradise and, then af and after being told you don't belong here, you have to write a book. You can imagine how he felt. Mm -hmm. and he never went back until, uh, until he passed away. When and, and I know you mentioned it, but when you said about the pyramid, what, what what explanation did they give him as far as what that they helped or how was it? Uh, the pyramid is a tool. Uh, for example, the Great Pyramid of Egypt was actually built by a learned person from Atlantis named uh, Thoth or Thoth, T H O T H, mm -hmm. and he built the Great Pyramid in nine years using anti-gravitational technologies and also supersonic vibrational system to cut the big stones in a precise, precise manner. So once the pyramid is built, it, could, it can actually accumulate cosmic energy. So it's like an energy tube so that uh, the pharaohs actually used the Great Pyramid to communicate mm -hmm. with the people from other planets Okay. They also use the Great Pyramid to make rain because with the help of different uh, metal alloys, uh, energy can be concentrated in a way that clouds can form in the sky and okay. rain would fall. Okay, so in a way, it, 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 they were able to do weather manipulation for rainfall, yeah. which of course in that area, you know, the Nile, you know, yeah, if it's not for the Nile being there, for there's nothing out there. Was yes. Toth, was he human or was he extraterrestrial he was human he was uh atlantean um from atlantean. Oh, atlantean okay yeah, atlantean, so yeah. it, and so i i can take i can i can go ahead from there and he believes or that you know the atlantis and that they were some that were able to escape from atlantis yes. that made it to different parts of the world and that's why we see pyramids and some structures between these civilizations that even though supposedly they had no contact they're very similar in some of their whether it's the mathematics or the structures or again like you said how did they build this how were they able to build like for example in south america and peru and bolivia that the incas and mayas not only would they do the pyramids and these things but they were doing up the mountains where the air is very thin that even without exertion people pass out because you know they even have to uh, chew the coca leaves to help them and you're thinking, how did they build, take these quarry these stones, take them up these mountains to build these huge temples and palaces or whatever? I mean, that's a big question mark when you think about it. Because I yes. think that even now, if they told a modern uh, engineer, do that, they'd be like, oh, <laughs> it'd yes. be like quite a job. And this book actually gives the explanation, um, yes. which is that uh, about... 14,500 years ago. So this book is very interesting. It's very specific and precise uh, to the year. 14,500 uh -huh. years ago, um, a continent uh, existed um, in the Pacific Ocean called Lemuria. Yes. So people on the continent actually 
had the uh, advanced knowledge of building the Great Pyramid and also uh, using uh, some of their technologies to build uh, uh, stone structures or statues. Uh, some of them remained on the Easter Island of Chile, like yes. in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> yes. So I actually visited there and I saw the uh, Moas. And mm -hmm. They were just amazing. And, and they did that to commemorate this group of ETs. Um, they, they actually um, made a stylized version of how they looked in the past. Okay. Um, but before they were going to transport <clears throat> the stone statues on the East Island to the capital of uh, Lemuria, okay. an earthquake struck. Um, and because of the gastro spells beneath the continent, uh, volcanoes, volcanic activities uh, occurred and the entire continent basically sunk into the ocean instantaneously, okay. overnight. So that's why a lot of the technologies and also the great civilization got lost. Um, it, it's really unfortunate, but, uh, but the author actually, Michel de Marquet, was taken into that event, okay. into the past, and actually saw and experienced what it was like when the continent sunk into the ocean. He had a very detailed description on what occurred, how the king was having a meeting with his council members um, regarding the possibility of uh, an earthquake, a major earthquake occurring when suddenly the earthquake occurred and people were scared and running all around. A uh, very detailed description and, and very interesting details. And some of um, the descriptions also implied that uh, the people from Lemuria actually colonized parts of uh, where um, the people Peru in Peru were living mm -hmm. in Bolivia and also in Atlantis as well. So that's why you're able to see some of the ancient architecture, um, archaeological sites in which some of the stones were built in a, very, in a way that even modern technologies cannot build them. Right. So let so me ask you, are you saying that Lemuria predates Atlantis? Is that what he said? That's right. Lemuria predates Atlantis. And actually, the people on uh, Atlantis uh, were colonized by the people in Lemuria. Okay. Right. Right. Because I've heard, I've heard that the destruction of Atlantis came about because the, 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 their technology got away from them. In other words, they got in over their heads with their technology and basically it destroyed their land. It, and of course you had like, the ones that could get away got away, but the majority, like you said, it sank into, and the majority, the technology, the, the majority of it was lost and the majority of the people were lost. Yes. Um, and I had heard of Lemuria and that mm. makes sense that, because of course now you know that they're finding that all these, um, all these ancient civilizations and all these different artifacts are in reality much older than was originally estimated. That's exactly. starting to come up now where they're saying, no, we made a mistake. This, this, even the Sphinx, they, they say that, that it's much older than it was originally, you know, said that it was. And, and I think that's happened with a lot of things in the ancient world where they saying, oh, this is the earliest. And apparently there's, an earlier version. And, and this, this book gives the years. For example, the uh, Great Pyramid of Egypt was built 17,000 years ago. So, okay. And the people who landed on the continent of Lemuria came about 300,000 years ago. And so what are they? What are their origins? Are they earthlings or are they, were they brought? They were not Earthlings in, in the very beginning. They were from uh, the, the planet called uh, Arimo X3. So they mm -hmm. looked like uh, pollinations okay. on Earth. So on their planet, because of overpopulation, they were thinking about moving some of their population to Earth. So they did uh, some kind of uh, exploration, reconnaissance, um, and, and also um, they first uh, found Mars. So okay. at that time, 300,000 years ago, there was life on Mars. Okay. Um, but then because Mars uh, was uh, cooling down the, the core of 
Mars was cooling down so that it's going to, it was going to lose its atmosphere. Um, mm -hmm. So they knew that Mars was dying down. Um, so they found they they went further and found Earth. So they first uh, landed on uh, um, uh, um, Lemuria, the continent, where only like a few groups of uh, people from China were living there. Uh, okay. They had a war, they had a fight. Okay. Uh, the Chinese people were very suspicious. I, they're still very suspicious. So in other like, words, they're saying that there was already humans as in Earth humans already on the planet. Yes. Okay, okay, I understand it, it, now. It talks about the history of uh, Earth, where the okay. black people came from, where the yellow people came from. And actually, okay. the black people and the yellow people um, came uh, about 1.35 million years ago for another okay. planet. Okay. Um, so black people came uh, and then landed in Australia, and the mm -hmm. yellow people came and landed in Myanmar. Okay. Because they're uh, finding now that a lot of these early humans that they thought didn't breed, interbreed, they did, like Neanderthals yeah. and other species that they said, no, these these existed parallel to modern humans, but they never interbred. Now they're finding, of course, when they do DNA, you know, on people, they're realizing, no, wait, you've got some DNA in you, either Neanderthal or something, depending on the part of the world, that they now realize that there was crossbreeding. Uh, so in other words, some of these species really didn't die out. They just integrated into what was there. Yes, I can tell you one example is that uh, before the black people and yellow people came to Earth, they were living on a different planet called Bakaratini. Okay. On that planet, they didn't interbreed at all. So they were the two races were separate. But okay. on Earth, um, after a certain time, and after the Caucasian people first landed um, on Atlantis, um, people interbreed. So you see in North Africa and also in the Middle East, mm -hmm. so those uh, Middle Easterns and North Africans, they were actually the result of interbreeding of uh, Caucasians, uh, the Blacks in Africa, and also uh, the uh, Asians from Asia, the, the yellow people from Asia. Right. So, yeah. So that's so, uh, and also from uh, over years, so there are some physical, uh, because of environmental changes, they were mm -hmm. adapting to the local environment as well. Of so course, of course. Different kinds of right, people. because like all animals, you know, humans, it's adaptability. You adapt to your environment to survive. So, yes, of course, you know, whatever the climate is, except, did they ever say anything because you know that there's the Basque people that live there off the coast of in Spain where they have a high percentage of RH negative blood types they have a a language that really they have never been able to pinpoint exactly the origin did they say anything about that well they didn't really specifically mention about the Basque people mm -hmm. the Basque country uh, but they did say that uh, there were other races of uh, ETs uh, constantly observing us and also okay. sometimes live with us, among us. Okay. Um, and uh, it's very interesting because I, I, I see that uh, um, the author in the book actually met another uh, ET from a different planet. In which mm -hmm. they're like a very very strange looking creature they say they've been observing us over the last a few thousand years okay. but they never interfere with our lives okay. um, but on the other hand some other ets they um, live with us for for a certain period of time including um, the theobans and just try to help us and try to guide us and uh, Specifically, I want to mention about the Jewish people, the Hebrews. Mm -hmm. They actually came to the earth. They actually came to us about 12,000 years ago uh, by accident. Uh, they were actually relocating themselves to another category of planet, uh, category three planet, uh, where they came from. Um, but earth is a category one planet. So, but because of some malfunctioning of their spaceship, they mm -hmm. had a crash on Earth. So okay. only, at last, only three people survived. 
and and they uh, started the Jewish race, the Hebrews. Okay. Um, so this is uh, where they came about. So they came from a higher category of planet, and they uh, they actually survived uh, over the years. Right. Exactly. So, because I'm thinking, okay, for any um, for any type of being to exist here on Earth, like you said. They have to be carbon based. In other words, they can live here they, like us, whether they're not exactly like us, they have to be able to live, exist here. So I imagine what you're saying when they have different categories is that they when they go exploring, they have depending on the life form is where they could settle if they were looking for another planet. So in other well, words, there's other human type of us out there that might not be exactly like us, but that they're enough like us that they could live here. Yes, uh, I mean, uh, the rule is that they have to relocate themselves to the same category of planet where they ah, came from. Ah, okay, I see. I understand now. Yes. In they other words, be... you can't you can't colonize up. You can't put yourself up. <laughs> right. You cannot live on a category three or category nine planet for mm -hmm. a long time. Um, ah. and, and the author actually says that he can only survive on a category nine planet for nine days but no longer than nine days. Which is why they only, they brought him back within the right nine days. Space. Yes. Okay. And that makes sense because let's face it. I mean, when we say life out there, it's life as we know it. There could be other types of life forms that we just don't understand how they exist, but they do. But just because we don't know about it doesn't mean it's not there. Let, did he have, did they ever tell him at what point, if ever they will actually expose themselves or come out and say we're here for sure we're here <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> they have done that in the past and they're they're uh yeah so they don't they've done it in the past for example the stories in the bible sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. so they destroyed the two cities because the people in the two cities were setting a very good a very bad example for people who were in contact with them. They right. were like cancer cells spreading the disease. So they had right. to do something. They couldn't find any single righteous person. So they destroyed right. the two cities. So this is one time they exposed themselves. They also helped us secretly in the past. For example, okay. during World War II, um, they prevented Germany from being the first country to develop the atomic bomb. They helped right. the US government to develop the bomb uh, much faster than Germany. Right, because I heard that it was that they were uh, that that they were on the verge of of developing it. That's what I hear. I, I mean, without knowing the specifics, that's what I've heard that they were very close that their scientists. I mean, you could you could say they were Nazis, but they were brilliant. They were very intelligent as far as developing technology. What's the word out of the box? Like we're going to mm -hmm. go beyond what in other words, maybe science eventually would have gotten there, but at a much slower pace. And they mm -hmm. were willing to, the scientists that were working there. Yes, I've heard of that. Um, and as a matter of fact, that uh, I was reading recently, as a matter of fact, that Sodom and Gomorrah, that they have, they have found evidence that basically they, these people were obliterated by like a asteroid fireball kind of thing that basically wiped everything out. That there was, and there was no warning this was not like a catastrophe where you say okay in a three days we better get out of here this thing came in and just decimated everything in the surrounding area and now they've actually found proof in the environment of what occurred because you know a lot of times people were saying oh sodom and gomorrah is that biblical that really that place didn't exist but it did exist and they found evidence of what happened to it or what the basis of the story is and yes. that's very interesting what you said about them. You know, so a lot of why, time. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. So that's why the book was so, uh, like, impressed me so much that I had to go and find the author because everything okay. matches everything that I learned from the past. Um, it provides a lot of evidence and new evidence is coming to prove uh, the details in the book. So they, they really did reveal themselves, uh, not only for distracting the two cities of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, but also mm -hmm. they um, they actually inter intervened uh, 2,000 years ago by sending Jesus Christ to us. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. And what they, was it the message of Christianity? Is that what his purpose was? Uh, to be more precise, is the teachings of Jesus Christ okay. was actually the main purpose of uh, of doing so. Um, not not the Bible, because the Bible was actually later uh, distorted by right. You the, have the Old Testament, and the New Testament, and the Gospels, and everything. I, I I I know what you're saying. That as far as the composition, it's like wow. There's a million hands that have gotten you know, into developing and altering it. That part I understand. So, but anyway, keep going with what you were saying about them sending Jesus. Yeah. So I, I actually, I should go back to Moses because okay. uh, they, they actually helped Moses to lead uh, the Hebrews out of Egypt. So you, okay. you see in the Bible, uh, Exodus, it talks about parting of the sea. Uh, mm-hmm. It was actually done by, uh, by the ETs, uh, according to this book. They okay. parted the sea, which was really shallow at that time, uh, using like a force field. Okay. Um, and also they led uh, Moses to their destination uh, only in about uh, three and a half years or so, not 40 years or so. So they, right. they actually, this book corrected a lot of the things in the Old Testament and also the New Testament. And mm-hmm. what, amazingly, the things that... Uh, it corrected made perfect sense to me resonance okay. in my heart <laughs> right example, right I mean, right i understand what you're saying that you read it and you're thinking something inside of you is saying this is the right thing yes i mean i mean moses leaving the people for 40 years in, in, in the desert that couldn't have been i mean so mm-hmm. so lo- that's just too long to be true right. three and a half years that's reasonable so this yes. is my mindset when reading this book um, so after Moses, uh, uh, a few thousand years later, people were expecting like the Messiah come into, into the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, but be- because uh, um, people were so uh, not into spirituality, the Theob and this group of ETs wanted to help by uh, creating this kind of uh, um, uh, very uh, unique event in which uh, people thought that uh, the Messiah was born. So they inserted an embryo into the uterus of uh, Virgin Mary. Okay. So baby Jesus was indeed born from the Virgin Mary. Right. right. And indeed, King Herod killed a lot of babies afterwards. Right, because uh, of the they, prophecy that, yes, that he would yes. be usurped. Yes. And then when, when that was about to happen, they moved uh, Joseph, uh, Mary, and the uh, baby Jesus to another location near Egypt. Uh, and then when uh, things quiet down, they came back. Um, because uh, the baby Jesus was born from an embryo, Every, when, when everyone is born this way, um, the person forgets what happened in his or her past lives. They have to pass what they call the river of oblivion, forgetting all the knowledge, all the ability to perform miracles. So that baby Jesus, even though he was really intelligent, smart and acute um, and very spiritual, he couldn't really perform any miracles. Um, And he traveled to India. So that's why there are some people say that Jesus went to India. Right, like where did he go for all those years? Yes and went to China and died in Japan. So right, that's I've why, heard of the Japan. Yes, I've heard of that. So that's why there's a uh, tomb of Jesus Christ in Shingo village, Japan. People can look mm-hmm. it up and find yes. uh, very interesting details about it. Exactly. So, and, and, and the first time I read about that, I was like, Japan? I, you know, that was that. But then I read up on it, and you're absolutely right, that there is a version where he went into Asia. And ended yes. up in Japan. Yes. So that's the Jesus who couldn't perform miracles. Highly spiritual, highly intelligent, and very smart, but couldn't perform miracles. That's why you don't see any records of Jesus performing miracles before the age of 30, before right. he started preaching. So um, the one who could perform miracles and who preached um, love and all the messages was actually one of the ETs from Theoba. They okay. made a body of Jesus 
that looked like the one who went to Japan, and then um, inserted themselves into that body of Jesus. Okay. And then took on that body and began preaching. Uh, the reason they had to do this was to show um, that this Jesus Christ could perform miracles because at that time people didn't believe um, anything unless they saw that this was someone um, able to perform miracles, the son of God, the son of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Jehovah. And mm -hmm. um, so that's why they had to impress people at that time uh, to make them believe all the teachings of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, which was, I was curious, when they implanted the baby into Mary, he was human. It was a human embryo. It was a human totally embryo. human. Totally human. No, no, no ET. In other words, it wasn't a hybrid. It was totally human. Yes. Okay. And I'm going to ask you, and they, they might not have explained it for all I know, but why? Why not let her, let's say, marry Joseph and say, you know what? Uh, she, when she gets pregnant, we will guide that child. Was it? because they had done something a certain way to that specific embryo. Do you see what I'm going with this? Like why, why impregnate her versus waiting for her to have a child with her husband? Um, and you see because, where I'm going with this? Like yes, why? Because people were waiting for the Messiah to be born right, from, yes. virgin, from a virgin yes. woman. So they ah, had to the prophecy. Of, okay. I understand yeah, that. See? Okay. Okay. So that's the reason. Right. And, and and I know from what I understand that they were really expecting the Messiah to be a warrior versus a a peacemaker or, in other words, to preach that that's not what they wanted. Because, of course, the Jews were under the dominion of the Romans and they were looking for liberation. They wanted to get the Romans out of there. So they were thinking the Messiah was going to be a liberator, a warrior, because, of course, that's the only way they saw that they were going to. And of course, it sounds the plan was different. In other words, the, you know the ideals. But of course, I understand when you're living under those circumstances. You know that's what the people wanted to hear. The Messiah is going to. But then, of course, the message resonated. You know, from what I understand, with the common people. You understand what I'm saying? And that's why yes. it became so popular. And um, and of course, it, you know, the Christianity evolved from there. Was yes. that their purpose when they went ahead and said, okay, we need to keep going and present Jesus, you know, like you said, with the ability to do the miracle. In other words, to be witnessed, have doing miracles and all of that. Was the, the purpose of that to to be able to present him as a Messiah or, or, or why? The purpose was to make people pay attention to this uh... Uh, person um, who could do the things that they couldn't do and to pay attention to the teachings of Jesus Christ. Um, okay. The main purpose of Jesus Christ coming down is to preach spirituality and love mm -hmm. and also more importantly by showing people that he resurrected three days after being put on a cross that there is life after death and there is okay. reincarnation. But somehow the concept of reincarnation got removed. Yes, the, uh, that's what I understand. That right, yes. that the reincarnation part, it was like it's a one-way trip. You go yeah. into heaven or you're going into a hot place, but that's it. No redos, in other words. Right, right. and I was going to ask you because I know you made reference to the reincarnation part. And I, I, and I understand that there was before in the Bible reference to uh, re, re, uh, reincarnation. Okay, as a matter of fact, with John the Baptist, etc. But I understand perhaps why it was removed or by whom or for the reason. How's that? Um, well, obviously, it did they have a hand with any other religious leaders of other types of religions or was it only with Christianity? Well, this is a very good question. Um, the only other religion mentioned was uh, Buddhism or the Buddha. Mm -hmm. Um, Buddha was born earthly. And then in this book, um, the highest praise that it gives to earthling was actually the Buddha. Okay. And, and, uh, 
And also there are other political leaders such as uh, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, and uh, those are the other people mentioned. Right. Uh, so it really doesn't mention about uh, other religions. Uh, when it, it does this, it doesn't mention anything about it. It's asking us to do the homework. To right. See well, and, and when I say religion, what I really mean also is, uh, how can I say, a, a spiritual path. Do you see what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. even though you mentioned, like you said, Buddha, there's Buddhists, there's people that follow, regardless of their background, that they their religious practice, their spiritual practice is Buddhism. Do you understand? So the mm -hmm. impact is, it's gone beyond all over the world and beyond what happened when Buddha was alive. Same thing with Christ. You see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? It's like, okay, did they do this with other figures? Not political. You know, even though they lived in political times, but that their message was mostly on a spiritual and a way to live your life. You see what I'm saying? Um, that's very interesting because, in other words, they were always manipulating, but they kind of did it subtly, like with introducing certain people, certain leaders, or or tweaking, let's say, historical events, like what you were saying. Yes. Um, do they, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, with Star Trek, you know, that they have, and I'm going to use Star Trek as, as an example that you know that they had the prime directive which was if they ever went to a planet that was much more primitive that they would not interfere with the civilization in other words let them develop did they interfere with us because we needed the help or because they're hopeful about us in other words like we have they just need a little help but why did they think that they that they should help us because uh, it, it, it actually relates to the purpose of life. The okay. purpose of life is to grow our spiritual uh, abilities. Or it's actually okay. the main focus of life is our spiritual development. So when we deviate from this main purpose, um, then if we deviate uh, far enough, they're going to uh, lead us to the right direction, one way or another. So they, okay. when in, in the ancient past, um, when certain religious leaders uh, enslaved people mentally mm -hmm. and physically, they uh, sent uh, a dream to, they appeared in the dreams of uh, the religious leader, okay. asking him to mend his ways. When he listened, but his followers, his other like uh, followers didn't listen, mm -hmm. they um, actually led him to a location the ones listened were saved and the other who didn't listen were killed or destroyed. Okay. So this uh, three who listened learned the lesson and then um, really changed their ways and then uh, liberated the people who they enslaved before. So okay. they did that in this way. And I think um, the reason they took Michel de Marquet to their planet and then came back was actually to Send us, a, send us another warning that it is time to really focus on our spiritual development and not to focus too much on the material wealth of, of a person. So right. it's a very strong warning because, uh, you know, if you remember the Bible and the book of Enoch, mm -hmm. Enoch was really also asked to write a book. Right. Remember a few decades later, his great grandson Noah was asked to build an ark, and you know what happened afterwards. Right. So Michel de Marquet was also asked to write a book. Okay. So it seems that right now we are at a very critical moment of our time, oh, and yes. we need to change our ways. Yes. And, and I really suggest people to read the book, and, and to really know what the, the messages are. Right. So in other words, what you're saying is that even though they've helped us technologically, really what they're interested in is our spiritual development. Yes, exactly. Right. Because, of course, yeah, and that makes a lot of sense as far as now when Michelle, obviously this happened to him when he was an adult. But as when he was growing up, did he ever feel or think that there was something special about him or something that made him think or was this his first encounter? 
Well, he was uh, really an interesting figure when he was young. He didn't have a lot of uh, education. He only went to high school okay. in France. And then he went to uh, the military in Africa, like the French military in Africa. And uh, he had a very strong, he was a very strong-minded person. He didn't follow the orders. He was, he had uh, his own independent thinking and will. Okay. So when other people followed the leaders of the military, he didn't. He okay. was uh, the rebellious one. Mm -hmm. um, he was always like that. And he always uh, thought uh, independently. He didn't really um, give any dignation to the leaders or dignity to the leaders. And, and, and though he, he must have gotten in a lot of trouble. Then. <laughs> yeah, he, he had a lot of, got into a lot of trouble, yes. <laughs> um, one thing about him was that uh, after he came back, um, you know, after he was told, you don't belong here, you have to go back and write a book. He wrote a book and he, um, he tried to let uh, as many people know about the book as possible. Uh, a lot of people didn't believe him and he had a major emotional breakdown okay. because even his wife didn't, didn't believe him. His wife uh, was uh, uh, thinking that he had an affair with another woman. So oh she, boy! So she oh, that's where he went for the nine days. Okay. Yes, yes. So, yeah. so she actually divorced him. <gasps> oh. So so he had a terrible experience after coming back. Okay, okay, right. And you know what you hear about that? Where some people, it's it. Yeah, there's a there's a downside from from pursuing what it is, especially when you're saying something that other people will go. You're lying. That's not true. <laughs> what? You went to an alien world? Why don't you tell me the truth? You were off with another woman. What is this that you went to another world? Yeah. In other words, I can see why she made me not believe them. But uh, yeah. So, but he persisted. It sounds like he kept, he, he delivered on what they asked him to do. So he had a major depression and uh, mm -hmm. he told uh, to some of his close friends, like Yuling saying that, you don't know what these people did to me. They destroyed my life. So he was really emotional and, and sure. really, really kind of uh, depressed for a long time. And then mm -hmm. in order to make himself a little bit better, and he moved to Vietnam, a okay. southern island in Vietnam, in which he said that uh, um, scenery where he found uh, on the island was a little bit similar or had a little bit of resemblance to the planet Theoba, which seemed okay. to him like 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 a heaven, like a like a paradise. Okay, so in other words, he was trying to pursue it as close as he could. Yes, and and the twice the two times that I visited him, um, he was uh, telling me he really didn't want to live here anymore. He didn't. He he really wanted uh, them to take him away to the planet again and well you know what it, it almost sounds like you know I, i'm sure you've heard of people that have had near-death experiences where they don't want to go back they're like yes. you know they, sometimes they're sent back other times they have children and they come back for their children but but if it wasn't because of that they wouldn't come back uh yes. and it almost sounds like he had a similar experience and did he yes. ever remarry what happened with him as far as his family life so after he uh, traveled to Vietnam, he met a local lady in Vietnam and married the lady. Mm -hmm. And uh, where he lived, uh, kind of uh, like a hermit, he didn't uh, go in public anymore, unless okay. uh, some tourists happened to meet him by chance. Right. Uh, that's actually how I found him. Um, some tourists took pictures of him and where he lived. Oh. I didn't know his exact address. I just showed the taxi driver. <laughs> wow. The, the picture and then the taxi driver took me there. Yeah. So he left the rest of his life in Vietnam then? In Vietnam, yes. He died in Vietnam. Interesting. That is so interesting. That people sometimes, oh, you know what? And did you uh, obviously i saw pictures of you with him um what when when was it that he passed away he passed away four years ago in 2018 okay. uh, just four months before i visited him the second time 
Okay, did he leave any type of manuscripts or anything after his death? Well, he wrote this book and two other books. Uh, the other one is called, the other ones are called uh, Nature's Revenge and mm -hmm. uh, She and I. And he was also in the process of writing another book about himself. He was okay. into maybe like 20 pages or so, but he didn't finish it. Okay. When I asked uh, about the manuscript, um, and his Vietnamese family told me that uh, they threw them away. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, my God. I can't believe they did. That's a shame. Yeah. Yeah. And did he have children? Did he have children with the Vietnamese lady? With his wife? With the Vietnamese lady, no. But with uh, his um, first wife, yes. Oh, so he, he did have children from his first marriage. Okay. Yeah, he, he has two children. Okay, okay. So... I can't believe, you know what, I hate to say it, but I know that sometimes that happens where something is important, but other people, like, they don't get it. It's like, uh, right. let's just <laughs> throw this out. Um, so what do you, I'm going to ask you, Samuel, have you ever been abducted? No, I have not. Uh, but in my dream, I had one uh -huh. dream when I was in elementary school. Mm -hmm. uh, in the dream, I was so eager to move up to a higher level. I said, okay. why don't I move up to a higher level? What do I do? What do I need to do to move up? <laughs> okay. Okay. Then, so in other words, yeah. you never know when you least expect it because maybe, you know, if you're going to be, you know, carrying on with what the message that he was carrying on with. And sometimes, you know, you know, things sometimes start off through dreams as far as communications. You know, maybe that's how they start with the preparing you. How's that? Because yes. if you think about it, even though you spoke to him and he described it, it's got to be very different if you have that experience. People don't re like you described that after that, he was like, I don't want to be here. I want to be over there. And I know I can't be there. But so it's like you said it. And I hate and it's almost it kind of ruined his life in a way, because if he would never have been abducted without knowing what would have happened, but it sounds like there was a, a repercussion from that, him being taken over there. Yes. If he hadn't been abducted, he would have lived a normal life. Being yes. a landscaper in Australia, like raising mm -hmm. cattle and growing foods or plants. Mm -hmm. um, that would be like a, that would have been a very normal life for him. Right, right. Yeah, people would have said, well, you wouldn't have, you know, some people you say, well, what, you get a chance to go to another world, but then they don't never realize the downside. Once you have that knowledge, you can't unknow it. It's there in your mind. So what do you do? You see you what know, I'm saying? It's, it's just like me. Um, you know, the reason of me locating him and finding him, taking mm -hmm. so much trouble to meet him was to find out what else he knew about and didn't write in the book. And? Because in the postscript of the book, uh -huh. he says there are more incredible things that I'm not allowed to write in this book because we are far from understanding them. So that got me. That got me very curious because okay. the and... things he wrote in the book were already incredible enough. What's more incredible about it? So did what happened when you went to see him? Did he talk to you about something that wasn't included? Yeah, the first time, I mean, he didn't. He was uh, really annoyed at my visit. And, but then, <laughs> but then he, he, he thought that I could help him in a certain way because I'm Chinese. He showed uh -huh. me a contract. Um, he signed with a Chinese publisher. Uh, okay. The publisher paid him $2,000 for the copyright to have the okay. book published in China. But he never heard from them again. He wanted the book to be published in China. He wanted me to follow up. So okay. I was very eager to uh, to please him. Okay. So I uh, I gladly took the, the the mission and to to really follow up. It turned out that the Chinese publisher was so afraid of the censorship and the Chinese oh, government. Oh boy! They okay. Not publish it. <laughs> right. I have a copyright to a book that now I'm afraid to publish it because it <laughs> <this laughs> right. happens. It they paid two thousand dollars already, uh, <clears throat> and then Michelle de Marquet asked me to find another publisher, 
-hmm. and to have a book either published in China, in Taiwan, Hong Kong, or even Singapore, just mm -hmm. a Chinese speaking country. Okay. Um, after a lot of efforts, you know, through personal connections, through cold callings, I finally uh, was able to find a willing publisher uh, right. for his book. And then before um, it got published, he sent me an email. He said, uh, I don't know how they knew it, but the book was going to be published in China. They were really happy about it. So they allowed me to tell you one thing that I was not allowed to write the book. Um, but you have to come to me in person. I have to tell you in person. Okay. And the reason I later found out was that he didn't know how to type. Everything he wrote in the email was typed through his niece. Okay. So he didn't know how to use a computer. Okay. So in order to, to keep it uh, confidential or private, mm -hmm. he didn't even want his niece to know about the content. So I, I had to go there in person. Right. And the, you know what? And people don't realize that because they think everybody knows how to use a computer or anything. They don't realize that sometimes. So who published it then? The, the new publisher or the original publisher? Who, who published it in China? The new publisher. The uh, new publisher. It's, yeah, it's a very large publisher in China. It, it, it's uh, published uh, as a uh, science fiction in China. Ah, I see how they got around that. Okay, science fiction. It's like, yes. it's fantasy. Okay, that's that's an interesting, yes, I like that. I like that. And I see something that what you got it, it was also published, I think, what, what did you say in Taiwan? As in well? Taiwan. It's published in Taiwan as a nonfiction. And it's a complete ah. version of the book. <laughs> interesting. There you go. So how the you curious categorize? people, the, the people who have the determination, can really read the, the Taiwanese version of the book. <laughs> oh, okay. Samuel, so are you going to write a book, Samuel? Uh, in, in a few months, yes. <laughs> I thought so, because I'm thinking you got, you probably learned a lot of things verbatim yes. from Michelle that it was never in that original. What, what, because he published the book when in the 1980s? Uh, the book was uh, written in 1989, and it got okay. published in 1991. Okay, so that's a long time for yeah. things that he talked to you about that were not part of the original manuscript. Right, that's, that's actually a long time after, yes. Uh -huh. I see. All right, Samuel, for my podcast listeners, what is your website address? I'm going to put a link in the credits of the show, but what is your the link, uh, the, the your... your um, where they could find more information about this. They can find information about the book uh, by typing uh, Theoba Prophecy on Amazon. It's on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And my website is chinasona.org. Okay. C-H-I-N-A-S-O-N-A dot org slash okay. Theoba uh, with a capital letter T. Okay, right, Theoba. And, and, and you know, we they're seeing here, but like I'll put a, a link in the credits to the show. And... I would love for you to come back. Do you have an, are you going to be publishing something soon or you don't know yet? I actually published a, like an article. Mm -hmm. uh, the a book it was going to be like a few months after, but I, a lot of people ask me, what uh, did he really tell you in which uh, I cannot reveal or he couldn't write in his book? Um, they didn't really, I mean, the people, I mean, he didn't really tell me that uh, I couldn't mm -hmm. write an article and make it out of a, like a, make it like a puzzle or like okay. a riddle. <laughs> so that's what I did. I wrote an article mm -hmm. about uh, the second coming of uh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Let me ask, Samuel, did he tell you anything that you're saying? This is really interesting, but I cannot talk about this. This is too way out there. Did he ever tell you something along those lines? About the... That he said something, of course, that wasn't in the book, that when mm -hmm. he told you about it, you're like, wow, wait a minute. This is too crazy. If if I put this out there, people's heads will explode. Well, um, this uh, the thing. One thing he told me about. I would say, if I were to reveal it publicly, I think ninety percent of the people wouldn't wouldn't believe me. Mm -hmm. See, um, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, even if I tell it, it's going to mm -hmm. like no one is going to believe me, basically. And but he did reveal other things like uh, the Sphinx. Okay. Uh, he says very similar to Edgar Casey, and 
Mm -hmm. that, uh, there are three chambers beneath the Sphinx. Right. That when time is ready, um, when they're to be opened, when we are ready, they're to be opened, then everything will be revealed. Um, right. The knowledge and everything happened in the past. Um, and he also talked about uh, the grace, um, what I just mentioned about the implants. There's absolutely no danger about the implants. They are not right. harmful at all. Right. And I've heard that some people also, are people are weirded out with that. And and I kind of I understand why though. I understand why people are feel unusual about because how can I say? I guess nobody wants to be monitored like that. You've got something in your body, if you know, to our psyche. That's like uh, especially when you're it's done without permission how's that because if somebody mm -hmm. tells you hey i'm going to monitor you for an experiment and you're okay it's different so i could see yeah. why that would be a problem for some people yeah uh so you don't have you're, you're working on a book but you don't have a definite publication date right now i'm trying to not yet because i'm trying to see what people are interested in knowing like mm -hmm. what are the most uh, frequently asked questions so i can put the res uh, the responses in the book so so you if know what? you have any yeah. samuel i think a lot of people really always wonder are they friendly or are they uh, will they be friends or will they be in the eventually enemies you understand because well, like what stephen hawking says where he warned if you have a civilization that is far superior to you to us in technology we're basically at their mercy in the sense of that if they ever became hostile, what could we do about it? So I think that a lot of people wonder about that. Everybody's kind of already, because of Hollywood and movies and science fiction and all this, a lot of people are on board with the existence of extraterrestrials, but they're always wondering, are they going to be friendly or are they not going to be friendly? You see what I'm saying? I can give you a brief uh, response on that. Yes, yes. First is that if they are really hostile, they wouldn't uh, need to wait until far oh, or maybe in the future to do anything about it, to right. attack it or anything like that. So they must be friendly. And the second uh, is that um, uh, the essence of spiritual development and spirituality is about unconditional love. So when mm -hmm. Michel de Marquet was uh, present um, with this, uh, was being with this uh, group of aliens, ETs, he felt love from them. A okay. great uh, sensation and comfort, and and really there was absolutely no fear at all. And the third is you really need to realize and understand, and really need to have independent thinking how this world is run. So, when they really want to create a lot of wealth, mm -hmm. such as uh, um, making money from wars, they have to create wars. They have to create this kind of imaginary enemy, mm -hmm. so that uh, so that uh, we are easily controlled by sure. the politicians or the it's, people. It's distractions, such as yes. well, yes. obviously besides making money, but yeah, it's a common mm -hmm. enemy on the outside instead of being able to pay attention to what's going in within our society, because all of a sudden that's a bigger threat. So yes, absolutely, I agree with you. I agree yes. with you a hundred percent, and. Yeah, I think though that's another thing. I think a lot, a lot of people, the majority of people, are fed up. They don't want wars. They don't. Nobody wants a war. I don't think nobody wants to lose, um, you know, their loved ones or anything like that. And I don't think most people nowadays, most modern humans, are ready for that or want that anymore. Mm -hmm. Samuel, I would love for you to come back when you've got your book out. I will keep tabs on it, and I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. It has been absolutely fascinating to talk to you. Thank you. My pleasure. Take care. And I will keep tabs to make sure I ask you back when you've got that book ready to go. Okay. Okay. Great. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. That is so interesting. Yes. And you know why? Because some of what he's talking about, I know there's people going, huh? What? I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm, I'm one of these people like, you know how they talk about freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of this, oh, it's freedom of ideas. Hello, that's where it starts out, the idea. Okay, whether you agree with it, whether you don't agree with it, 
whether you know you think it's far-fetched or whether it resonates with you like that makes sense and by the way it did this was a recent um that came across about Jesus that there was a couple of shrines in Japan for Jesus and I was like what Jesus Japan How, what you know I'm, I'm still I'm still on the Dan Brown you know he went with Mary Magdalene to France somewhere <laughs> it's like what Asia or you know then of course then you have the the I believe it's the uh the Church of Latter-day Saints where he came to America and it's like Asia yeah but again um, and it's very interesting to hear a version of, because you know what? We always associate extraterrestrials with technology, you know, it's flying saucers. We've gotten, we've recovered the, uh, these, uh, spacecraft as we've back engineered. And that's why we've advanced with our technology so rapidly, blah, 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 blah. Very rarely, to be honest with you, do you ever hear a connection between extraterrestrials and spirituality or that their interest in us is for spirituality. It's always, no, you know, it's like, it, it, I want to say for lack of a better word, it's almost like spirituality, um, that's like besides the point. It's either about our genetic material, okay, or... Um, that we've gained technological advances because we've captured the ship or, and of course you have the version of, you know, there, we have some type that, no, not we, let me, let me phrase that differently. The governments have some type of agreement where they have an exchange, whether it's humans for technology or whatever, you know, hybridization, you name it. Let's go down the X-Files rabbit hole. Um, so, but never the spirituality. Never the spirituality. In the sense of, and if we go with the ancient aliens kind of theme, you know, where they say that a lot of these ancient uh, civilizations uh, who they depicted as gods were in reality extraterrestrials. All right? And what I mean spirituality in the sense that these gods had temples and priests and cults and you name it all right and then in reality because the civilization at the time were kind of on the primitive this is the only way they could explain that a person supposedly had these powers all right in other words you couldn't be you couldn't be a regular human you you know or the concept of an extraterrestrial was more difficult you had to be a god or a deity of some type but not true spirituality as in spirituality and remember all these temples if you look at them i mean when you read all these stories about all these whether it's the greeks or the romans or even far back into babylonia egyptian all, it, all these um all these gods or you know whatever they were always about appeasement all right yeah you could ask the, the the god or the goddess or whatever if you wanted something material or if you wanted let's say a safe childbirth but it was always um you know depending on what scale are, are you know are we talking hey bless the the you know make sure the nile rises so that we have uh fertile crops you know that's on the larger scale and as far as the individual it was like of course um you know safe childbirth or something like that but it really didn't address everyday spirituality as in not the give and take of materials i want to say maybe till around christianity which from what i understand is why christianity appealed to different people because of the approach it had versus all these other type of religions remember a lot of these by the way a lot of these uh gods and goddesses and deities and religions or whatever you didn't appease them just when things went wrong. You always had to like make sure that they were taken care of when you know just to keep things good. Which is, by the way, a lot of these priesthoods, um, this is how they had power. They were very jealous of their power because uh that's why they had these huge temples and of course, you know, the offerings were not only a dead pigeon, you know, if money, food, whatever. And 
let's face it, even into more modern times, when I say more modern times, not BC, a lot of emperors, rulers, whatever they are, always realized that for them to really be solidly, in, in other words, the last thing you needed was for the priest class to turn against you. Because then you were going to be in deep doo-doo. So it's a, it's a weird kind of dynamic, not really weird, but it's human nature. Um, but anyway, yes, getting back to the original point, you very rarely, have, no, to be honest with you, I have never heard of the ETs being interested in our spirituality or to develop develop us spiritually, all right? That's a new one. But in a way, it's almost like you're glad about that. Um, and one thing, and this is my, like, I've mentioned it before, this is my version that, what if we have new ETs? What if the ones that were around in ancient times hang out and they left? <laughs> they left. And these are new ones. Because you think, okay, how long are you going to study us? <laughs> how long are you going to, or try to give us ideas or push us along or whatever? At some point, you, it's either you either get it or you don't, or okay, you're on your own. We eventually you'll figure it out or okay, we're going to have the big reveal. Here we are. You know, what What if these are a whole different set of ETs? That, you know, somebody, you know, you know when you go to the counter that you take a number. Maybe it's somebody's got a counter with the, the number to go visit Earth. And, you know, that it's like, okay, my turn. Get out of here. We're, we're going to go and mess with the Earthlings. Why not? Or the other one where... Uh, the ones that are around are stuck here. They came here, something happened, who knows what. They're whatever, however they travel interdimensionally, light years, whatever, doesn't work. It Enough so that they can get around the earth, but never to break away and go where they were going back or to where the new destination. And they've kind of like become a hybrid earthling, but they're not earthlings, they're ETs. And they're kind of stuck here. Why not? <laughs> so many ways this could go anyway guys i hope you like the show i really enjoy speaking to samuel all right it's something different and believe me this is basically what we need exploration of new ideas and theories and whatever it is because somewhere in there okay think about it there's a lot of ideas that later proved to be true that originally when they were first presented people were like huh come on what the earth round no no we're the center of the universe what are you talking about you know, hey, that Galileo guy, <laughs> that kind of deal. So come back. I have a lot of great guests. I have a lot of people lined up. I will be doing the live stream. I don't know by the time I stagger this. If not, it'll. I'm doing a Halloween live stream. Let's see what I come up with that. A lot of interesting stuff. And again, don't forget that I have the new book out, Phantoms of the Follies. Phantoms of the Follies on Amazon, MP Pelliser. And it, some people ask me, well, what is it about? Is it a ghost? And not really, not really. What it is, is it, it talks about the Ziegfeld Follies, which he did. He started, remember, this was in the time where the jazz era, Prohibition came out. Things, people went wild, okay? People went wild, you know, hem, hem, women cut their hair, flapper style, the hemlines went up. A lot of crazy stuff was going on, all right? And Florence Ziegfeld, uh, put on this review in New York at the New Amsterdam Theater where he had all these scantily clad girls which were driving guys wild. And he even had on the roof of the theater a what they called the Midnight Frolics, which were like really risque. Anyway, guys were going crazy. And all these girls, they would flock and basically unknown girls uh, overnight became sensations because once you were uh, pulled into and, and identified as a Ziegfeld Follies girl, and by the way, the Ziegfeld Follies would only run for like three or four months every year, every season, from, I think, June to September, okay? And they had the Ziegfeld Follies, they had a chorus, they had another one called the Ponies. But anyway, the whole book is about, it's incredible how many of these girls, um, some of them made it, but a lot of them, to the point that even then they were saying that becoming a Follies carried a curse with it. And that's what the book is about. That's what the book is about about how it seems some of these girls had so many promising things. If you look at the odds, it is. It is incredible how many of them 
you know, I do give examples of others that made it, but like, yeah, you could almost say that there is, and by the way, that there is supposedly a ghost at the New Amsterdam Theater that was taken over by Disney that, you know, repaired it because later on it kind of became like, uh, you know, the theater became, it fell into this repair and became a movie house and Disney like put it together and it's real pretty, it's beautiful. They, they look on the interior and supposedly one of the girls, the ghost is a very early Follies girl called Olive Thomas. But then when you read this book and you'll see what I mean, if you read it, that it could have been a bunch of girls, not besides Olive. They, they were all very beautiful, of course, because Flo Ziegfeld, he, that was one of the things. He became like a connoisseur of women. Like if the girls in the Ziegfeld fall, she's a beautiful girl. All right. And that it could have been Olive, but it could have been a bunch of other girls that just, that this was the moment when they were in that theater was when they were the happiest, the most popular, where they were being showered with gifts by millionaires. So yeah. So again, look it up on Amazon. But till next time, guys, thank you for spending this time with me. Take care.